Welcome viewers, I've got Hank Plessier here. He's been um, a, a contributor and organiser for IEEET in the past. Uh, he has been a journalist for 15 to 18 years, has started a comedy institute and even a couple of preschools. Hank, would you like to give us a, a more detailed uh, version of your background? Okay, uh, well I'm a Californian. I grew up in uh, the Los Angeles area. I went to college at UC Santa Barbara. And then I moved to Northern California in, when I was 21, and I've been in San Francisco now for about exactly, exactly 25 years. And uh, I got involved in transhumanism and futurism about, just about four years ago. I started writing for, uh, actually I took, a, I took a year off uh, five years ago, and I went with my family to Costa Rica. And uh, we lived in Costa Rica in the jungle for a year. When I came back, I needed work, so I contacted Are You Serious? Uh, because he'd previously been an editor uh, for me. And he was then working on H Plus Magazine. So it was extremely kind of uh, accidental. Uh, I, he said, uh, you want to write for me? And I said, sure. What's your magazine? And he told me what it was. And I had actually never heard of the word transhumanism before, but I started writing. Uh, for him about four and a half years ago and it was it was immensely fun so I went from writing I think about 25 articles for H Plus magazine and then I started writing for IEET and I wrote uh, a lot of articles for them for about a year and then I uh, worked as managing director there for a year managing yeah managing director and then I, I left and I started a, a very fun website called transhumanity.net, which was, uh, I didn't have enough time to run it. So I, I, I gave it away to Zero State. I moved on to another site called immortallife.info, and then I moved to the present site, which is called brighterbrains.org. And uh, so I've been a writer and editor, and now uh, I'm going to start producing conferences. And conferences are very fun for me. Uh, I actually have a, a theater background. I was... Um, uh, a solo performance artist for years. That that goes way back to the the late 1980s and early 1990s, and then I was a slam poet for a few years. So I've I've uh, I enjoy the stage and I enjoy putting on putting on events. I've done a lot of events and event promotion. I I uh, produced uh, what is on record as the world's first atheist film festival. I did that about five years ago. And uh, I also, uh, this will sound uh, weird, but I also put on uh, the Bay Area's first Buddhist performance festival and the Bay Area's first uh, Muslim performance festival. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Whatever <laughs> goes. Eh? <laughs> but, you know, what's, what's, oh, the, the thread running through all of that is that, is that I, I have found that there's a lot of, um, there's groups that, uh, they're they're large groups, but they they haven't put on like a, a, a sort of a centering event, like a like a conference or a mm -hmm. film festival or a some kind of performance festival. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fun for me to sort of be an organizer and put together conferences and festivals. Okay, wow, well, certainly sounds you certainly cut up to to do this sort of thing. I have put on a number of conferences I have a, myself yeah, well. actually um, in in What's Melbourne that? mostly. Oh, you just, so. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I, I completed one last year. It was science, technology, and technology in the future. Um, although that we don't have the critical mass of people in San Francisco, uh, but we still got to get reasonable attendance. And um, yeah, they've been really good uh, up to date. They've been fun. But yeah, I, I can't imagine one, doing one every month. Well, I, I mean, I don't know if it's going to work. It, it could <laughs> fail. Uh, there's a little bit of history to that, try. which is... Uh, I knew some people in Washington D.C. and they wanted me to put on a, a life extension festival there. So I, I went to Washington D.C. I was last September and I put on a radical life extension conference, and only 44 people showed up, and that, that was quite disappointing and expensive. Mm -hmm. But it was still fun to do the event. But I, I I realized after doing that that I should really stick to my hometown and try to try to make it work in my hometown. And uh, this last event is. I mean, this event that's happening in three days is, uh, I mean, it, I've switched venues uh, twice. I, I, got a, I got a room that held like 
a hundred people and I filled it and then I got a bigger room and I filled it and then I got a bigger room and I filled that too. So this show in three days actually sold out three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I, hopefully there's a big audience for this. Uh, yeah, I'm going to yeah. find out trying to do it every month. <laughs> I well, might wear every I mean, it sounds like you've got half, yeah. the, half the people, um, half the tickets sold anyway for the current room. So that's amazing. So Future Day, uh -huh. yeah, I'm, I'm going to be holding a Future Day uh, Lake Mini Conf in, in Melbourne as well, um, Melbourne, Australia, for all those who don't know where I'm from. Um, that's going to be fun. Uh, but it'd be interesting to talk to you about how you promote these things and how you actually draw the numbers. What is there? A, is is it pixie dust? Is it magic? Or, is, or what are you doing? Uh, is it? I, I think. Um... I, I think I got really lucky with this first show. Uh, I started off with just a couple of people that wanted to be in it. Are You Serious wanted to be in it, Sultan Istvan, and uh, then Rachel wanted in, and when Rachel Haywire wanted in, um, uh, suddenly more people wanted to be in, and I got uh, Randall Cohn wanted to be in, and then I got Aubrey, and after Aubrey, uh, it was very easy. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I think having a good lineup is everything. Um, I don't, you know what, I mean, I made a thousand postcards and it sold out before I even got them, a single one on a wall, so, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm missing you, what, why would you create postcards? You know, I made a, I got a thousand postcards printed up. Oh, okay. And, but I sold out the show before I even put any postcards up, so <laughs> I, I, can't, yeah. I can't say that the show sold out because I had a great postcard. Yeah. Because. Digital uh, media. So. Pardon me? You, you did yeah. a lot of digital media advertising? Well, you know, I did Facebook so much that I eventually got uh, banned, so I'm no longer on Facebook. <laughs> really? So, You've been banned from yeah. Facebook? Oh, God. Oh, yeah, I did. I did. I, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, and I, I tweeted a bit. And but I, I have just saw some... you on Facebook. Is that your clone? Uh, Oh, I shouldn't have said that. They're on to us. No, they banned me for 30 days, and it just I just got back on today. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. I did Facebook a lot, and that helped. And I had some good, I had some good email lists. Um, probably, I probably have uh, 1,500 email addresses, mm -hmm. and I think, I think that was, that's good. But I also think I just, I just live in the right place. And there, you know, you know, one thing I, I'm doing, it, which is, uh, uh, it's very low cost. It's a, it's an inexpensive conference. It's only like twenty five to thirty five dollars, which means it yeah. costs like th two or three dollars an hour to be there because it's a twelve hour conference. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, it's only I got one an, day, is it? It's only one day. Yep. It's from like mm -hmm. nine thirty to nine thirty. I got to mention, I also got sponsorship from Bulletproof Executive Dave yep. Asprey. Sure. He's yeah, extremely true. well. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah, I think so they, he's very well known around here. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, he, uh, uh, bullet. I put on a conference um, as part of Humanity Plus uh, on in in um late 2012 in San Francisco, and that 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 was that, that ended up being pretty good. It was a two day conference which was absolutely packed. Um, with speakers, we got a, a like quite a reasonable amount of t attendees too. But it um, the amount of speakers we had to spill them out into um, into a warehouse in San Francisco. So yeah, too many people wanted to come and talk, <laughs> but it was good fun. Uh, yeah, and I remember uh, that that yeah. was the one at San Francisco. Did State. you come? No, it was at I San didn't. Francisco State University. Yeah, me and Natasha yeah, organized that. I remember that? Uh huh. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know what was the cost of that. Maybe maybe my cost is lower. Yeah, I, I, think, I, just... I think your cost might be lower. Um, the the venue uh, I think wasn't too expensive. Uh, we didn't like go for a really posh venue, uh, but it was a little bit out of the way. Yeah, I think the venue was the biggest cost, and also, well, I did some videoing. I was meant to get paid for that, but I hadn't been paid. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the the venue I, the venue I got is quite popular, but it's extremely expensive. It's called Fort Mason, and it's right on it's right on the water. It's lovely, but it costs it costs just thousands of dollars. So, uh, right. I think I had to sell like 180 tickets to uh, break even, and and then the capacity is only 200. Right. So, uh, that, that's 
Yeah, so but you're I, obviously not making a whole heap of money on these conferences. <laughs> no, you know, no, not a whole heap. Uh, I'm going to rent cheaper theaters next time, and and I, you know, there's a little bit more money to be made, you know, like rent renting tables, things like that. Mm. But I was going to mention something else. Um, I think in my advertising, I I kind of talked a lot about the biohackers. I got Rich Lee coming in. I don't know if you know him, mm. but he's. He's a he's a biohacker, and so things are going to happen. Like people are going to there's these uh are there's these microchip implant devices, and so people are going to be like putting uh, chips in their face. What in their be, face? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're gonna they're gonna be cutting their ears open and sticking in magnets, and and so oh. I and I tried <laughs> to make it out like it was going to be kind of like like. A little bit more like a extreme, like a cross between an academic conference but extreme future festival kind of. Yeah, the grinders. Weirdness to watch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went to extreme future festival. Did a few interviews there too. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was so we'll on. see. I don't know. Uh, it was, uh, say, I actually really enjoy the sales part more than anything else, and just putting exclamation marks on what a wild fun show is going to be and so yeah. I, I like I like the sales aspect wow. I, I'm a little bit weaker in the actual organization uh-huh so that, yeah. that's what I got to get together in the next couple of days is I'd actually, say San Fran sounds like the most fun place to be at the moment <laughs> in the world <laughs> oh that's that's nice mm -hmm. you know in regards to doing these conferences once a month uh, I'm 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 trying to reach out to different audiences, not just transhumanist and futurist audiences. Mm -hmm. Like I'm doing a, a the show in April is called uh, Eros Evolving: The Future of Love, Sex, and Marriage. Yep. So it's gonna have it's gonna have some futurists there, but very unusual for a transhumanist conference. It's gonna be majority women speakers. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna have about eight or nine women speakers and just five men. Mm -hmm. And uh, I and in the lineup I've got you know women talking about polygamy and uh, uh, oh, I have ex prostitutes talking about prostitution and you know this kind of stuff is uh, <laughs> hopefully it'll bring in a different audience. Yeah. And, uh, right. So so but this and, is going to be I, uh, introducing a lot of uh, new people to the ideas of transhumanism. Is if transhumanism or uh, futurology is going to be a theme, right? Is that, is yes, that, there's going to be futurists and transhumanists in every conference, but there's going to be other speakers in it that are probably never heard of yeah. transhumanism and never really think of themselves as futurists. But they're doing sort of alternative lifestyles or they're doing uh, sort of alternative things that mm -hmm. I think uh, fit into a, a conference about the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, it certainly will t turn some heads. And uh, look, I wish I was there. I'd <laughs> it sounds like a fun thing to go to. Oh, come on over! I, <laughs> come on, I need I need videographers. As yeah. you know, I was trying to find a new videographer today. Yeah, well, I know I know it's pretty hard to find them. But um, the thing is, it just takes a whole lot of time to like edit videos and and uh, you know to get on planes. And then what you're doing is you're carrying around a whole heap of like machinery with you all the time. Things go wrong. You lose nuts, screws, and little bits and bobs. Um, and you know there's always the risk that something will break and something will go wrong. But it's in the end, you know, when things work out, as they always have in the past, luckily so far, uh, touch wood for me, it's been a positive experience. But it does, it is quite labor intensive after the fact, after you've done the conference, and you need to edit and upload all these videos. <laughs> as you know, my YouTube channel is like I've I've got over 600 videos now, 600 public videos. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. these are just like uh, simple interviews. A lot of them are like scat Skype chats, but a lot of them really are the the conference talks from uh, conferences that I put on. So there's been about six or seven so far, <laughs> not including smaller ones. Oh yeah, no, no, actually that would be some of the smaller ones as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean my conference is going to be twelve hours long, and that's just a really long DVD of. Uh, yeah, uh, I the yeah. videographers. Try to sell it, and I, I, I hope he, hope he can. Wow, yeah. So, so are the the videos going to be public, or are they going to be like um just on DVD? And that's uh, it. I think what we're going to do, uh, because a lot of people didn't get to go see this show, so mm. I think the videographer is going to try to sell the sell the uh, DVD to people who who wanted a ticket and didn't get into the show. Right. 
And then, uh, I mean, but the, you know, you know how conferences are. I've got people from around the world saying they wish they could be here. So we'll try to sell them the DVD as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I've never had, um, I've never really sold DVDs or sold any video material. It's always just going up online. That being said, I do want to create a documentary, um, and I've got a few ideas. I'm working with David Pierce actually on the hedonistic imperative. I've got heaps of like talking heads that I need to sort of get some good B-roll for. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've got the material there, except for maybe arguably some of the B-roll to fashion into at least a a, a comprehensive mosaic on like uh, the hedonistic imperative and transhumanism in another and the singularity in another and all those sorts of things just making them uh, I guess digestible and exciting enough for people to sit down for 45 to an hour and a half um, and listen to these ideas yeah I might get yeah, some yeah. points from you yeah. I think you, you'd be pretty good in how to like if I do um create some rough drafts maybe I'll run them by you and see it see if you uh, yeah think I mean you. you check out singularity weblog right yeah what yeah. Nicola yeah, yeah so he's got all this singularity one-on-one -on -one stuff uh, uh, you probably have something similar yeah I mean, I but don't he doesn't have a website sell for it on his website yeah yeah you'd have to I, I, I've mine is just a, um, a YouTube channel although I've got a large amount of subscribers now I think I get about 35,000 views a month yeah. So uh, to date, there's been about seven or eight years worth of watching. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it it, it it's encouraging when I see <laughs> these stats. <laughs> yeah. So yes, the conference coming up. Yeah. Um, there's I don't, one I don't in four know. days. I, I, there's one on Saturday. I guess it's actually uh, three days away. Oh, three uh, days. Two and a half days away. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Two and a half yeah. days, right? Today until, is yeah. until uh, ground zero in right. San Francisco. So you want to tell us who's com uh, coming to this conference? Who's talking? Oh, gee, you're, you're asking me to do that, and I might forget somebody. Um, so uh, Aubrey de Grey. Yes. Uh, Aubrey's going to be there. That's that's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, Rudy Rucker, who's a science, science fiction, fiction writer. Author. Yep. Yeah, Randall Cohn. Yep, uh, it's actually cool. You no, know, Ra Rachel Haywire had to drop out. Mm -hmm. um, I heard. But I, I, I replaced her with uh, Maria Konovalenko. Are yeah. you? Do you know Maria? I do. Yes, she's so, uh, the uh, the Russian advocate of sins. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so Maria's in it, which is great. And then I, I really don't want to forget anybody's name. Uh, well, we have Zoltan Isvan. There's too many people. Zoltan Isvan, Christopher Janet, who helped organize Extreme Future Fest. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, Anatoly Karlin. You. Who's a local local Russian. Scott Jackish. Um, and then uh, uh, Rowan Horn and uh, Shannon Ivana, Shanna Friedman. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, help me out. Who have I forgotten? Oh, A. Oh, Jolly. Yeah, the photographer. That's right. Yeah, and and and, and um, the, abdomen model. <laughs> yes, and the abdomen. I talk about that all the time. Yeah. Um, Actually, so, A. Jolly is really great. I yeah. when I did my show in Washington D.C., he was in the lineup. Yeah. And he was so wonderful that I I just begged him to come to this. Yeah. Um. I mean, I mean, there really are so many good speakers to get which is one reason I'm doing another show immediately because I there's so many people I couldn't put in it like John Smart um, you know he he deserves to be in a show or, or like Max Moore and Natasha Moore I didn't mm. get them into this one so I yeah, gotta get them in yeah, yeah, that's right yeah John Smart's amazing um, yeah he's done a lot and people often forget that he was he, he, he actually organized a number of conferences in the early noughties and maybe late uh, late 90s as well. Um, he's got a, an amazing uh, blog there too. Excel Singularity Watch, or is it uh, S Acceleration Watch? Yeah. <laughs> I recently yeah. made a made an image of him with a meme on it. <laughs> Not a meme, but one of his quotes yeah, to promote John Future was, Day. He was, yeah, he was really helpful on the second. He was what he was probably the first person I got to be in the in the second show. Yeah. Uh, because all of this takes, I can't. You know, it's it's basically me asking people to do me a favor and. And and me asking people to sort of trust that I will get an audience there to listen to them. Mm -hmm. So John John's been really wonderful. He trusted me. He said, "Okay, I'll do this show, although it's a little weird doing it 
30 days after the other show, but mm -hmm. I, okay, well, let's try it. And then, uh, because he was in the lineup, he helped me get uh, all, a lot of other people. This is for the March show. I have Brian Wang, who is the uh, blogger at Next Food Future. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, have a, I have a really great lineup. Uh, it's just great. Mm hmm and, and it is really good. Um, when you, if you do a number of conferences, then people who, who are really good talkers, who've got something really interesting to say, um, get a chance to say something. Otherwise, what you get is the same people speaking at conferences all the time, right? You get people who, who you yeah. always see at conferences, and they look, and they deserve it. You know, they've they've done a lot, and mm -hmm. and they've had a lot to say, and they they are doing wonderful things. But um, you you don't get to hear everybody because they're just the, like the celebrities of transhumanism in a sense, right? Uh huh. I, I wanted to mention one thing about that, which is another reason I think I I got these people in the lineup, is I think a lot of conferences they 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 go, we really want you to come and talk, and uh, you can have ten minutes or you can have fifteen minutes. But I told all these speakers. Uh, you can have as much time as you want, and I think I think a lot of speakers are just dying for, you know, an hour or forty-five mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got speakers talking for a long time. We'll see how that works with the audience. Yeah, but, well, that, uh, that's I, an approach that I've taken with the conferences in Melbourne. Um, give them an hour, including question and answers. I like uh, when Aubrey de Grey came over. I gave him two talks, and I, I, I wanted to extract as much information as possible, and also subjected them to about two hours worth of sitting in front of an interview camera, too. So, <laughs> while feeding him beer, so he wasn't too disappointed about that actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really sort of uh, like a uh, sponge as much information as I could while he was already in Australia, so it was amazing. Um, same with Randall, Randall Kuhner, um, and yeah. Ben Goertzel, and Steve Mahundo and, and uh, a lot of the sort of well-known transhumanists out there. When they're in Australia, I, I just want to yeah. make sure that they the yep. Yeah, I get the impression from Randall and Aubrey that, because I didn't actually ask them to be in the conference, um, I, I didn't think they'd want to do it. And uh, <laughs> I, I had these other people, and... So they both contacted me, and I think they decided at some point that the conference was going to be a party, and they didn't want to miss it. And sure. so they were just they just contacted me and said, "Can we be in your show?" And of course, I said, "That's great." Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's awesome when these people are already around the neighborhood um, to do that. And yeah, for sure. I mean, Aubrey de Grey is fantastic. He was he, he did a really good job in Melbourne. You see, Melbourne's a bit of a biotech hub of the uh, southern hemisphere, so we had a few scientists come in. You know, with their sort of, uh, uh, yeah, they, they brought their um, their skepticism along. So it was interesting some of the the questions that they asked Aubrey, and he, one of them he put them in the, put them in their place because they were confusing engineering from from science, right? <laughs> so that was interesting. Yeah. Um, we, I wanted to mention something about that. It's <laughs> kind of funny because I sent out uh, thirty press releases to all the local press, right? And and nobody is coming from the local press. Really? But right. I have, I have a, somebody from the Daily Mail is coming. Right. Uh, and uh, now that, that's not R Randall's joke about the Daily Mail is that they always run jokes. They always run articles like uh, three-headed baby bites dog and things like this. <laughs> and I also and I also have reporters coming from uh, something called the New York Observer and the New York Post. Uh, I, so I have reporters flying in from far away, and I also have a couple of people coming up from Hollywood, like producers and d directors. But I don't have the local press, so I, I don't know. I don't know what that says about. Maybe maybe know. once I see articles coming out in the Daily Mail and like Hollywood people coming along, they'll say, "Oh, next one will come too, right?" Yeah, you, 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 it sounds yeah. like you're going to make them uh, wish they had have come along. And next time they'll be uh, have a little yeah. There's a there's always a lot of uh, weird things going on in San Francisco. Is is news in other cities, but it's not exactly news here. Mm, right. So yeah. I think that may be the kind of article that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, yeah. So and then in a couple of weeks, there's another conference which you're putting on, which you've just mentioned, and that's, oh, that's got a that's March. That's March first. Um, That's March first, which is future day, everybody, and don't forget. So if you can't, you know, if you can't physically make it to Hank's uh, Transvision Visions conference, I recommend you organise your own little events uh, all around the world and and uh, get get active, and help promote the idea of a 
of the holiday that's that, that's forward thinking instead of always just um wor like uh, remembering the past and rescripting old dialogues. So yeah, there's some amazing speakers. Look, we've got John Smart, we, who we just mentioned, who's got a, a like a key position in this conference as well. And of course, on the board of Humanity Plus is Natasha Vita Moore, and I share like a the board with her, so she's coming to talk. Linda Glenn, also from uh, Humanity Plus, is coming to talk. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Wonderful. Wish I could Humanity make it Plus, over. Is just, they've been wonderful. Uh, I've been selling a lot of tickets through their mailing list, mm -hmm. which, which is which is great. Yeah. Definitely. You know, when I think of Australia, I think of people like uh, Russell Russell Blackford. That's right. You know, yep, he's in he's Castle a, He's Maine. a wonderful writer. Yeah, he's, uh, what he's a, got a lot of... Uh, he, he, I've interviewed him a couple of times. Oh, yeah, and so he's done a number of like... Uh, he's, he's got his fingers in so many different fields, like law, um, philosophy, uh, bioethics. It's Yeah, he's got degrees uh, under him. He's, he's amazing, and he's a science fiction writer. It's great. Right, right. <laughs> it's good to he have someone to like that in Australia. Superhero super movies as well. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And also, do you know a, a bioethicist there named Rob Sparrow? Yeah. Um, both, uh, both. I think of, he's both, really interesting. Yeah, well, he came and spoke at the first um, conference, which I did, first big conference I did in Melbourne, the Singularity Summit in Australia 2010. Um, and so, yeah, he he kicked off the con uh, the conference with some controversy. So Robert Sparrow was there, and Russell Blackford spoke at the same conference. Yeah. So isn't cool. isn't Julian Savalescu from Julian Australia? Julian Savalescu is from Australia. In fact, I've got an interview ready to be um, processed with him in it. Uh, yeah. 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 He's he's quite good. He's from the Centre for Practical Ethics in in Oxford. He spends right. part time in Oxford and part time in Australia at Melbourne University. Yeah. He was um a PhD student under Peter Singer actually. Yeah, right, so. right. He's a he's a he's a wonderful thinker. He's a very interesting guy. Oh he certainly so. is, yep. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. he's a bit of a provocateur. But what he does yeah, he, he, I like he about him. Yeah, that's right. So he he'll he'll um he'll introduce scenarios so that people can talk them through in some sort of so Socratic dialogue so that mm -hmm. some issues that wouldn't have been thought about otherwise would would come to would you know uh, come to people's attention and I think that's an interesting thing he doesn't necessarily agree or um, advocate some of these stances that he argues for which is quite interesting yeah yeah on a personal I know that level he'll, he'll yeah, he'll he'll venture into eugenics, which is kind of like a off limits territory for a lot of people. But it certainly is. I know I'm not against eugenics. It's just that the word seems to conjure up like a World War Two, right? Um, right, Nazis right. Nazis doing what they thought they were. You know, I guess they thought they were doing the right thing, but they didn't. They really had bad arguments for doing it. So eugenics. I mean, yeah, I think that's a really interesting topic, but it's it's sort of tabooed in a sense. I mean, <laughs> I suppose I I wrote an article for um, IEET which was called uh, "Ban Baby Making Unless Parents Are Licensed," right. and it, it got uh, 275 comments, mostly negative, until they cut the thread. Wow! And uh, uh, that was fun. It was re really quite enjoyable, yeah. but it, it did it get people very very got worked up. Thinking. Yeah. I'm conflicted. Sometimes you can go too far like that. I, 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 I get the sense that it's great to get people's attention on ideas, but to what extent do people reinforce or re, uh, or further entrench their ideologies by arguing like that? You know, um, once you if you get people's lizard brain invoked, then you you just really sparking the the, the extreme conservative. Um, aspects of thinking, you know, and people often entrench their their views by arguing for a certain point, right? Um, so, what do you think? Yeah, but there's a there's a whole lot of people like in the middle that uh, they'll say that they hate it, and then you just I, I this is a topic that I bring up about once a year, and you know people are changing their mind on it uh, and starting to think maybe maybe it's not such a crazy idea, and and I think I think. Transhumanists need to say, um, you know, they need to bring up controversial ideas and and you know, certainly it does get attention. That's for sure. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess is there any caution that you'd apply to um, how you talk about eugenics, or would you 
favour talking about it in a compl- the most controversial man- manner possible. Where, where, where do you sit on the, the scale of, um, you know, trying to be delicate with the issue uh, or just trying to, you know, get as much attention as possible? Well, I was really inspired. Uh, I was re- I got interested in, in parent licensing after I read a book about it uh, written by a Canadian called Peg Tittle. And one thing she pointed out in it is that most of the people that are actually in favor of parent licensing, they're, they're, they're things like uh, preschool, preschool teachers, which I was, and social workers, and just people that are around uh, children, young children, and watching their family life and just thinking, these people never should have been parents. Hmm. So um, uh, I, I forgot what the question was, but but well, I, well, but the I question think, was really about yeah. like um, how you go about like uh, talking about some of the the, the delicate issues. Um, are you careful? Yeah. Do you tiptoe, or do you just like a um, you know like a, a bull in a, a china shop? Do you just like a, go crazy and get as much attention on the issues? Uh, where do you sit? Like, do you think it's yeah? Do you think it's important to be careful with these issues so as not to give people the wrong impressions, or do you think it's important just to get? Does is that overridden by the importance of getting people thinking about these issues in general? Well, I mean, as a writer, uh, being a bull in a china shop is much more fun. Certainly, um, <laughs> I, I I know that uh, when I wrote the topic. Uh, uh, the IET had another writer named Kyle Kyle McCunford. Oh yeah, 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 Kyle Mitnick or whatever. Yeah, he actually wrote about the same topic, but his article did not get a lot did not get a lot of hits and attention. And I think because he simply wasn't uh, rude and aggressive enough. And mm. so when I wrote mine, I was a lot ruder, and uh, so I got more attention, more hate, or but you know more attention. Mm. Um, I, you know, my my point of view on it was simply that. Uh, most people in the world today still think that everybody has the right to have as many babies as they can, mm-hmm. even if they're uh, genetically unsuited to have a, you know, they're going to, even if they're drunks and are going to have children with fetal alcohol syndrome, even if they're terrible parents who are not going to uh, feed their children well or provide them with a good education. Mm-hmm. And possibly like uh, harshly discipline them. Anyway, or so through a divine my, mandate, right? <laughs> People believe that yes. God's telling them to have yes. lots of children. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, in the United States, we had that example of um, the octo mom. I can't remember her real name, but you've heard of the octo mom who had, I think she had like six a, kids. And, oh, right. I thought yeah. It was in she had like six a, kids and she had another eight. And oh. and there, you know, there's general agreement that this woman should not have had another eight kids. It's it's mm. totally crazy. But uh, but also I think that people who have a couple of kids who are are damaged by uh, by the parents' drug abuse or by sure. the parents' behavior in some kind of way they, they mm-hmm. I don't know it, it's not going to happen in, in the United States for it, 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 something like parent licensing will happen first it's already happened in China and it's happened to some extent in Singapore so mm-hmm. yeah right um, so where would you f- fit if if you fit into any particular uh what, what f- uh f- philosophy do you like P- what do you prefer do you prefer virtue ethics utilitarian or deontological ethics or do, where do you fit in the scale are you, are you a bit of all of them would you say or i are actually you a don't pure have utilitarian I don't have a, a big philosophical uh, philosophy background, so I, I I couldn't really adequately answer that question. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I just can't do it. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I think I think <laughs> I, I think from arguing with commenters over the years and them telling me I'm a utilitarian that I probably am a utilitarian. It sounds like you're a utilitarian. <laughs> Yeah, that's what a it lot of transhumanists like. are. Funny enough, is that right? That's more, I believe, yeah. a, a virtue ethicist. Um, I'm not sure if that's a, a self description, 
I, I'd like to interview him on that. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I, I find it I useful to to uh, to um, have these sort of uh, flagpoles of descriptions of different types of philosophies, because it helps people understand where they're coming from. If if I was like trying to argue against you, and I was a pure virtue ethicist, and you were a utilitarian, we might be just like uh, arguing past each other, and we wouldn't understand each other's arguments without really understanding. Well, virtue ethics are more um, centered around. Uh, improving individual characteristics, where utilitarians are usually interested in the the ends, like a you know the value of the end product of a of an act. Uh, if I was a virtue ethicist, I'd say, well, you shouldn't act in a certain way if it's not virtuous, if it if it doesn't subscribe to a a good character that a, a, the human should have. If it's not emulating a nice person, if you're not acting like Gandhi or or whatnot, for instance. Mm. So these starting yeah. points are, are useful to to sort of understand. And... I I have described myself as as a neuro optimist, uh, as a as a neuro positive mm -hmm. guy, and and what well, I think what I mean by that is uh, I I wrote a book called um, Brighter Brains: Two Hundred and Twenty Five Ways to Elevate an Inter IQ. Right. So I, I so what I mean by that is uh, I'm interested in in human behavior that is actually good for the brain and is good for mental health, is good for intelligence. So when I, when I talk about something like um, parent licensing, I'm talking about uh, bringing children into the world who, are, who have parents uh, who help them, who help their brains, who, who don't damage their brains but help them elevate their intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I, that's something, for me that was a value that is a value, and I think that's a transhumanist value. Uh, I did a survey called the Terrasim survey, where I asked everybody what their top priorities were, and the two top priorities are life extension and brain enhancement. Right. So if we take both of those into account, and all, and that's the majority of what transhumanists do, taking those two into account, then you have to think about, well, the priorities are physical health and mental health. Mm -hmm. Now it gets confusing because I think the third priority was personal freedom. So as soon as you throw personal freedom in there, then you get like these debates like, like who are you to tell me that I can't have as many kids as I want because that infringes on my personal freedom. Mm. And then I say, well, mental health and physical health, uh, they, they, they trump your personal freedom. Mm -hmm. You can you can follow that pretty simply, mm -hmm. and and also personal freedom ends as soon as they start damaging somebody else's uh, body and brain. Uh, you know, if you're if you're poorly equipped to be a parent, then I don't I don't think you should be a parent, even though you feel like you deserve the liberty to do that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, but yeah, but it's interesting that I I I found out as. From being the managing editor at IET, that the two things that uh, the two things that transhumanists argued the most about were were politics and religion, mm -hmm. which is just exactly what you're not supposed to talk about because everybody argues about it. Right, but, but they were but, politics but, but, and religion. IET yeah. is clearly like a democratic transhumanism flavor of uh, uh, of organization, isn't it? Whereas the extropians are very libertarian. Yeah. You know. Yes, IET would be uh, they. They're not. They're not libertarian. They're democratic socialists, uh, definitely. And that that's a big split. There's a lot. You know, back over here on the West Coast, there's a lot more libertarian transhumanists. People like Peter Thiel. Uh, surprisingly, religion was a bigger argument than um, than politics. Even though, uh, even though you would think that, even though when I did the survey, uh, eighty percent of transhumanists are atheists, the 20 percent that are not atheists uh, really want to be heard and, and there's a big debate about you know how much should they be heard or, or you know how, how seriously should we take the, the Mormon transhumanists and the Christian transhumanists and, and everybody else. So that I got, in, I got in a, a lot of arguments about that and, and eventually changed my mind actually. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was, a, that was going to be a question. Is there anything which you used to hold dear to your heart? that you cherished, a belief that you thought was, you know, uh, a core principle in your life that you'd have had to subsequently change based on new evidence, even though it was painful? Oh, just this one topic. You know, I was a militant atheist. Like I, like I, told, like I mentioned, I went from... Uh, you killed Christians. Starting, 
starting a uh, atheist film festival. And then I was at IEET, and it was it's kind of entertaining. Uh, I decided to throw a IEET party, and um, hold on just one second. Yep. I, I decided to throw an IEET party yeah. and invite a bunch of people. And uh, as it turned out, the majority of the people that showed up were Mormon transhumanists. Okay. So there I was, the militant atheist who'd been talking a lot about how people who aren't atheists have no business in transhumanism. And there I was spending like three days with the Mormon transhumanists. <laughs> and, it, and it turns out they were, they were just they were just great people. They are, they aren't just, they? Yeah. They were just the nicest people. And, yeah. And, and they're now my friends, and I'm mm-hmm. going to put them in conferences. And I'm certainly not going to become a Mormon, but I, I, there's certainly a place for them. So, mm-hmm. so perhaps that's an answer for you. Well, you know, I've interviewed Lincoln Cannon. I did a four-hour mega interview with him and sort of probed him on, on Mormon doctrine. And then I did another one with Carl Hale. They're two, like, Mormon transhumanists. I think Lincoln, Lincoln Cannon used to be the chair there. I, I'm not sure if he is... I think he might have just recently retired the position, but I'm not sure here. But yeah, great guys, very intelligent. Great guys, yeah, totally, yeah they're very totally interesting great guys. people. Yeah. The thing which I found I, interesting yeah. though um, is their approach to the reason uh, for progression, uh, personal progression, and that's where they fit in with the transhumanists. The Mormons think that we should eternally progress and and do, uh, and God wants us to um, become better people. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's a process that's important. It may not necessarily be the outcome. And so I asked them about, what if you could swallow a pill um, that made you more moral, right? What if you had a pill that yeah. would turn you into um, somebody as moral as Gandhi or Jesus or something like that? Maybe Jesus is not possible according to their ideology, but somebody just far more moral than you were. Um, and I think the both on both accounts, the initial reaction was, oh, no, I wouldn't do it because... Um, we learn from learning. We learn from getting better. Um, and I, 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 I felt the follow-up question was, well, what if you, what if the Mormons were the only people in the world not taking the morality pill and ended up being the most immoral people in the world? <laughs> so yeah, I think it was really funny. I mean, but they came around. I think I think both of them yeah. said they would. Uh, I think there are a few caveats, of course, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, would you take James, a morality pill? Yeah, James Hughes has written about that too. I think he posed the same question to Buddhists: if there was a pill that would give you the equivalent of you know Buddhist enlightenment, should we all take it? Mm-hmm. And I think they were I think they were a little divided on it. They didn't all say no, and they didn't all say yes. But mm-hmm. I think a lot of them said yes. We should take that enlightenment pill. Mm-hmm. So, does it matter how we get there? You know, I think I think I think I think enlightenment pills would be a wonderful thing. I think that would be. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in your I'm yeah. your camp. I, I agree with you. So um, yeah, yeah. It looks the other thing. The only other thing I can think of, which has driven my family nuts, and it brings up David Pierce, is that I've oh, yes. changed my diet. I, I've changed my diet multiple times since I became a transhumanist. Right. Yeah. For a while, for a while, I was a David Pierce style vegan. Yep. Because I because I I just love David and I think yeah, he's, he's he is amazing right yeah me ways. too he was in Australia just yeah. like a late last year for the conference gave two talks I uh, wrangled as much information out of him as possible and hours and hours of interviews so it was amazing yeah great guy yeah so but I but I <laughs> I've since totally uh, changed my mind and bailed on him and and now I'm a I guess it's called a Paleo Plus I'm a, a David Asprey bulletproof bulletproof executive diet guy eating right. eating a lot of grass fed you know beef from Uruguay and everything right okay so uh so i've i've changed my mind on that yes yeah and you not you though right you, you're, you're, you think you're, the suffering you think the suffering um from cows in Uruguay isn't all that much because they're grass fed and they're on pastures um and yeah you're not contributing to the factory sort of style farming and so is it is it is it for physical health reasons or for moral reasons that you 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 made change i think i think yeah i think it's i think it's a really interesting question you did bring up that there the life is different for a grass-fed cow Mm. and you know living on the the pampas of uruguay and argentina that's a very different life 
than it is for just some some beef, you know, locked up in a corral and uh, fed antibiotics and grain. That, that that is very different. I think the whole, you know, I'm actually from a a, a dairy ranch family, so I, I I've been around cows a lot and other livestock. Mm -hmm. It's it's very interesting what we've done. We've really created these 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 cows, these animals. Uh, they're no longer, you know, they're no longer wild oryx or, or, or wild pigs or boars. They're something that, is, that has been completely domesticated, and I, I don't really know, um, I, yeah, the moral question. I, I, don't, I guess I don't think it is as immoral as David makes it out to be. I, I don't see cows as these these. These cre I, I guess I see them as these creatures who actually can't conceive of any other life than exactly what they have, since we've we've actually created them to do exactly what is done for them. I don't, I, I don't know if we've. Yeah, yes. I, I think we've just yeah. taken like a a species, and um, I don't think we've really. Uh, I don't think we've we've uh, we, we've. Uh, um, We've created these like cows from what were they for, from wild yaks or something? I'm not sure where they came from. Uh, oryx. They're oryx. called oryx. Okay. Oryx. A right. e u yeah, r o c h s. Yeah. Fabulous, oryx. giant, powerful, dangerous beasts. Right. And over, are... the, over the many years of domestication, mm -hmm. um, we've mm -hmm. uh, basically created a whole new species. It, I mean, but you know, dogs. Mm -hmm. We've done that similar with dogs, but um. You know, dogs yeah. are interesting. Uh, they're, they're still dogs, and they still share, share some of the psychology of wolves, for instance. So I, d I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if a, a cow um, is completely uh, engineered so that it, 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 it's perfect for a factory. <laughs> I don't know if a cow would enjoy a factory. In fact, I, I, I'd say that it wouldn't. That being said, I'd, I'd say the, the life inside. A nice farm, a free range farm where it could uh, do do what it would without fear of a constant fear of predators, for instance, maybe a life even more worth living than one in the wild where they're constantly being hunted by wolves and, mm -hmm. and, and other predators yeah, I really don't know i d I don't think that don't beef think or sitting or sitting around thinking god i I hate this is terrible what's going on and I, I know I'm going to get killed and it's going to hurt and I and I hate it. I don't, I don't I think they're I don't think they're doing that. No. I think that there's a there's an interesting writer um, over at IEET called Dustin Eardock who is a cattle he works with cattle uh, cattle ranchers in mm -hmm. Madagascar. Right. And he he's written a lot about the ethics <laughs> of cattle raising. Yeah. Also David Asprey has 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 uh, Written some interesting things about the morals of his of his of the diet that he that he advocates, and he points out things like uh, you know vegetarians are there's no way to avoid killing because a vegetarian you have to like plow up you have to like harvest these crops and kill you know thousands or millions of bugs and gophers and turtles and mm -hmm. other kinds of creatures, mm -hmm. and he I think he said that you know one human being can live off. Uh, a half a, a half a cow a year, you know, a half half of a steer, mm. and he thinks that's you know that's one half of it's it still seems like a lot of cows in a lifetime. This is a this is a tough, tough question for me, Adam. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, look, it, it is like uh, it, it it is very tough. very tough. But you see, my answer to these questions is: Look, are we going to solve the problem with today's technology, or can mm. we develop technology to avoid or um, engineer out the negative? side effects of these of the problems we have today so yeah look I, although I think there should be some resources poured into uh, trying to s work out what we can to reduce suffering with the technology we do have today it's mm -hmm. for me on balance uh, we, we're not really putting a lot of a uh, uh, lot of energy a lot of uh, economy of attention into developing technologies which will ultimately reduce and phase out the the unfortunate side effects of um, society, so the society we live in, the suffering, um, the exploitation. So, 
I think that we really should be working on like advanced technologies that as a as a uh, some of like nanotechnology and biotechnology systems biology artificial intelligence if worked on in the right way may be able to bring about wonderful uh, consequences in in the future um, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to utilize these technologies to to reduce suffering yeah, to reduce and, the need and for always, factory always, farming and yeah. and, and uh, yeah. growing yeah. food in the way that we do and there's always uh, in vitro meat, which is exactly. um, yeah. we can hope for. Well, I'm hoping for that. Bill Gates has put a lot of money into that recently, so that's that's hopeful. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to have to um, – it's have dinner to time. Yeah, here. wow. And I'm, I'm at the dinner table, and my family is starving while I talk to you. It's, it's terrible. Oh, damn it. I'm yeah. Gonna, uh, well, look, I don't want to keep you from your dinner or, or uh, keep your family hungry. So it's been a, a, an amazing, uh, I think, half an hour. I think we were originally going to do one for 20 minutes, so <laughs> an interview for 20 minutes. So it's been wonderful talking to you. Oh, it's actually been going on for 50 minutes. <gasps> Whoops. So, yes, look, I'm, uh, I'm very uh, looking forward to uh, hearing about how transhuman vision cool. uh, will, will come about. Yeah. Yeah, we should trade some information about, you know, how to make conferences work in, in each other's city. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's true. That would be that would be great. I yeah. did you did you rent a uh, a room a conference room at at a, a Monash university. university? It was at yeah. RMIT University. Monash would be great, but it's it's not in the middle of the city. RMIT, because uh, I've rented there, it's already been like established. I've already got a relationship, and um, there's one one place which isn't too expensive. Collide Theatre, and that's been useful, and it holds a number of people, and they've already got the lighting and and all the AVs perfect. But it does cost money, and it means that ticket prices have to like uh, be bumped up a little bit. So yeah, it would be nice to have smaller conferences that don't require as much administration or worrying about having to um, sell heaps and heaps of tickets to pay for the venue. Yeah, it's. Yeah, mm. yeah. I'll, I'll send you. Thing for uh, me. Mm. I'll send you my. I'll send you my budget. You can look at that. I, I don't. I don't want to just talk about it on the air, but I can just yeah, that's send fine. you the number and show you how it worked out. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I can do something similar. Although my budget's rather organized, uh, I can still send you what you know what 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 I've done. Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, it's been fantastic chatting, um, and Leah, I hope to do it real soon again. Oh yeah! Now we now we know how to reach each other. Okay. Yeah. Cool, Thanks man. so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.